Minister Trevor Manuel has questioned uh, some of the lockdown regulations that government has passed. He says there needs to be a lot more consideration and more rationality in the way some of the decisions have been taken. Manuel says activities by the security forces during the lockdown also must be interrogated. He joins me now for more on this. Uh, good evening and thank you so much uh, for your time tonight, Mr. Manuel. Uh, firstly, did you anticipate that by penning the opinion which you put down in the Sunday papers, you would get the kind of reaction that uh, you have sparked today about uh, the state of the lockdown and the extent to which, as South Africans, we need to be questioning some of these regulations put in place? Well, Cathy, let me, let me just say at the onset that I think it's a very important issue that government is leading this process and we must support them in ensuring that we can prevent the spread of the disease because once a disease takes root, um, it's incredibly dangerous and people die quite quickly. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not in the camp that says, oh, I need cigarettes or anything. It's not that kind of issue. I, I believe fervently that South Africans must be persuaded to act in their own interest. And in saying this, I'd be echoing the voice of President Ramaphosa. We must encourage South Africans to act in their own interest. And what I'd said in the, in the article in the City Press yesterday, that one of the deterrents is a strong security force drive. We don't have a security crisis in this country. We are trying to prevent a deep health crisis. And therefore, our actions must be commensurate with a deep health crisis rather than a situation that might suggest that we are living under a state of emergency. And to the extent that part of your comparisons have, of course, looked at what uh, the state was like under apartheid South Africa versus what it would be like today under the lockdown regulations and saying that, in fact, um, perhaps the police and the defense force today are pushing their luck much further than would have been tolerated under apartheid. I'm saying, firstly, when we adopt, when Madiba made his inaugural address as president in May of, of uh, 1994. He used the words never, never, and never again. And it was about oppression and the way in which people get treated. And that is why we can never forget who we are and where we come from. We must not go back to what apartheid was. That is quite important. It means that we must respect all South Africans, and it means that we must expect respect in return from, from all people. And that is fundamental. A lot of what happened in, under apartheid in the last period, certainly f uh, from the mid-80s, was under a state of emergency. We don't have a state of emergency. We don't have a security issue. And therefore, it's important that the police and army be used in a way that gets people to understand the benefits of social distance and all of those issues so that we remain healthy and we prevent the loss of life. That's quite different from some of what we're seeing in various parts of the country. That's my first concern about, about uh, what's happening under the lockdown. The message that they were given by the president and, you know, all of us as a country watched when uh, the president said they must be kind to people to the point where uh, South Africans would want to give them roses, um, uh, even though they probably wouldn't be able to accept them. So, so given the fact that that is not happening, do you think that the deployment of the army is, is specifically needs to be reconsidered in this instance? I think that what, what is necessary in the circumstances, Cathy, is that the army be retrained. You see, I've heard, I've heard the minister say, mustn't provoke soldiers. This is not about provocation. And soldiers are trained to be disciplined. It's not about provocation. And therefore, we want to see a helping hand. You've seen this in many parts of the world where Police and soldiers go out and they encourage people to undertake social distance and this, that, and the other. You don't need this krachtadachet that you're saying. You don't need to arrest people for selling fed cook on the streets. You know, we mustn't have the police and army uh, behave in that kind of way. This is an act of love in the interests of our people, not an act of hatred. And that's what we expected under apartheid, but we shouldn't expect it now, which is why I think we've got to call it out the president when he deployed the, the Defence Force, he wore a Defence Force uniform and he said, I'm one of you. 
Let us go out there and demonstrate kindness. This is not about, in the words we use, kit, scop, and daughter. And since then, unfortunately, we've seen, we've seen that old order of behavior by our security forces. And I, I believe it's wrong. We must demonstrate assistance to our people. It's interesting because you talk about the role of the president and ministers being able to call out the behavior of the officials and condemn it in the strength that it deserves. But of course, in that court uh, application that we've seen by the president where several civil society organizations are trying to hold government to account, the president's uh, lawyers have said that he is not aware of such instances where uh, the law has been broken to, to that point and where uh, the soldiers have committed the kind of atrocities that they're being accused of. Kathy, um, we don't have to lawyer this thing. You know, one, one, can, one can watch news from Africa on any given day and you'll see the behavior of the security forces. You can go onto any news channel, you can follow social media, and you can see what's happening to people. I'm more concerned also, Kathy, about when our mothers and our sisters go out to get their child support grants or their pensions, that social distancing is applied because people are vulnerable and we can't have uh, our family members uh, 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 infected by, 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 by COVID-19. Social distance has to be there. But we see our grandmothers get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to get into the pension queue. Why are we doing this stuff to our people? We need to apply our minds to how we can minimize the risk rather than, than, than intensify risk. And that, I think, is something that we must have a conversation about as South Africans. We aren't all criminals. We must have this conversation because we owe it to ourselves to have this conversation. Earlier on in the interview, you brought up the word oppression and that um, th there must be a rejection of anything that resembles this being some state of oppression. Do you think that's what this lockdown is right now for many South Africans? Uh, Kathy, unfortunately, it begins to feel that way. If, if indeed the press is correct and a young man in Alex gets beaten to death and the, if the court records are, are true and those who are uh, uh, alleged to have beaten him to death aren't disciplined by the system, they continue to work as though nothing has happened, then it becomes oppression. We need to protect the lives of people. And there's nothing wrong, there's nothing in the regulations that says Kathy is not entitled to have uh, a beer uh, in, in, in her backyard. Yet, it seems as though that was happening and somebody gets beaten to death. We must not demonstrate any tolerance to misbehavior. I think it's that message that we have to get out. What do you think the president or even the defense minister needs to do to send a clear message about government's position? Of course, they've uh, stood up on public platforms and said that that kind of behavior is not condoned nor tolerated, but uh, clearly it's not enough. Kathy, the, this is an ongoing issue. I'm saying the Defence Force has, has uh, uh, a certain method of working. There are troops on the ground. There are non-commissioned officers who have to oversee them. There are commissioned officers, lower rank commissioned officers, above the non-commissioned officers, all the way up to uh, uh, the, the, the Council of Generals. Uh, it is set out, the method is set out in the Defence Act, and all that you must do is for that to work, so that those who were involved or alleged to have been involved in beating a, a, a young man to death must be reported on by those immediately above them. And the minister must know that South Africans love the Defence Force, we're not going to create a problem for the Defence Force. We don't want to see it as an oppressive force. We want to see it as our Defence Force. And therefore, the Minister must know we are on the same side, but we must be intolerant to misbehavior within the ranks. And bitter for, for the police. Uh, we've seen this in a number of areas. We've seen the abuse uh, at particular police stations. And Minister Taylor must be seen to be calling these things out and saying, uh, men and women in blue 
we should not tolerate any wrongdoing against our people. We are here to help them to understand why they must, they must live by social distance and preserve their own lives. That's all we have to do. And then in, in some of the other regulations, we must ensure, Cathy, that they are rational. I mean, across the world there are lockdowns, but we don't have to be irrational about how we go uh, about things so that you can go into a store, you can buy this but not that. Uh, uh, you can exercise, but please don't do it at five past nine in the morning. Uh, that kind of stuff is not rational. We must ensure that at all times regulations are rational because regulations under the Disaster Management Act are secondary legislation. They are made by the administration, the executive has authority, and the executive must always see or feel accountable for the decisions that they take and know that people will support them. But if people rise up or are angry about the way in which these things are done, then I'm afraid the lockdown will fail because there's too much inbuilt resistance uh, in the way in which we as South Africans approach uh, our responsibility because we feel that it's imposed on us. It shouldn't be that. We must own the regulations. We must own the lockdown. We must celebrate the achievements in saving many, many more lives in this country. So on that point then, do you think that alcohol and cigarettes should be sold, that that ban should be lifted? I don't want to be drawn into that. I don't want to be drawn into that debate. Uh, um, but what is important is that those taking the decision must explain the rationality. Um, I'm told, for instance, that there's more cigarettes available at a slightly higher price because it's smuggled. Uh, and all that you're doing is, is allowing the habit to continue, but there's no tax for government out of it. Uh, you've got to take a view on all of these matters. And it's very important that uh, government feel the need to explain to us as South Africans who aren't sitting in the room as part of the command council, who aren't sitting in the room as part of NAT joints, explain how these decisions are arrived at and why they are being gazetted and implemented. Similarly, the, 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 the curfew, it was brought forth from 8 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the evening. Why? Explain to us why these things are being done, not just because ministers are enjoying their power, but because of, of certain consequences if these things are not done. Explain to us why we couldn't be uh, exercising a bit more. I mean, yesterday the Prime Minister of the UK said to people, go out and exercise at any time of day, but stick to your small groups. Uh, we don't want to see large organized groups. Uh, but there's no sort of nine o'clock cutoff. Uh, I'm saying that, that, that we need to understand because we... We're not morons. We need to understand why these decisions are being taken. That is all. It's interesting because, uh, unfortunately, you're drawing me to, uh, to a place that I need to go to. When we look at uh, some of what has been said about these decisions that are being taken and the extent to which they're collective decisions, you look at what uh, the current finance minister, Tito Mboweni, has had to say that uh, sometimes you have to uh, swallow stones um, because of decisions that the collective has come to. So do you think that there is a level of perhaps tension within the National Command Council around how some of these decisions are being made, which is why there hasn't been the full transparency that you're talking about. Cathy, um, I'd, I'd be surprised if there were a cabinet anywhere that doesn't have tensions, that doesn't have debate. Um, I've, I've, I have the privilege of having been part of, of, of cabinet decisions for 20 years, so those debates are there. But I think that even if the debate is resolved, I mean, in the normalcy of life, you'd go to a parliament, and explain uh, the regulations. Parliament, I think, uh, is also affected by the lockdown. So I think that cabinet must have trust in the people, have trust in our democracy, have trust in the mandate that we gave them at the elections, uh, uh, and, and be able to explain this to us so that uh, we can go along with this, so that when the president says, as he did in his online newsletter this morning, Please, South Africans, we'd like you to be involved in the preservation of life. We want to celebrate that. We want to embrace that, that request by the president. But in order to do that, sometimes taking a bit of time to explain so that we go along with this 
becomes fundamentally important. All right, us. Mr. Manuel, I've got about just two more questions to get to you, uh, but I'm going to ask you to indulge me. We're going to take a quick break and we'll continue our conversation after this. Thanks for staying with News at Prime tonight. We're in conversation with former Finance Minister Trevor Manuel, who's questioned some of the lockdown regulations and has called for government to exercise uh, rationality when making decisions about what needs to come as part of this lockdown. We'll continue our conversation here. Uh, you would have heard some of the calls that have been made for the economy to be reopened. The likes of Business for South Africa are estimating that uh, close to 4 million jobs and even more could be lost if uh, the economy, the reopening rather, if the economy is stalled any further. What's your view on that? Cathy, it's not a debate and necessarily one to be drawn into, but I think that we mustn't suggest that we're dealing with trade-offs between lives and livelihoods. I think it's, it's, it's important to preserve lives and livelihoods. And part of the problem that we have in South Africa is, firstly, that the bulk of working families don't have savings, and so this hits them unbelievably hard. And therefore, we must be measured in the way in which we open it. And then a very large number of South Africans are in the informal economy and depend on what they earn every day. Uh, there isn't a weekly wage, there isn't a monthly salary, it's a daily income, and people need to be able to earn that, which is why we must apply the broadest spectrum of minds that we could get and ensure that we can deal with this issue because, um, you know, we, we, we've seen, we've seen the, the hunger, we've seen it in um, Olivenhood Post, we've seen it in Tafel Sikhi Mitchell's Plain, we've seen it in Lusiki Siki, and there are so many areas where people have demonstrated just how hurtful it is, how degrading it is to be as hungry as they are. And I think that all of us must step up to the plate and try and ensure that it's not just about handing out food, but also facilitating livelihoods, but ensure at all times that people are safe. But, but does that mean that the economy should come back uh, sooner than perhaps government may have been planning, simply because of the dire state that many of those that you're talking about are finding themselves in? Look, I think that, that there are going to be parts of the economy that will remain shut for a very long time, and there are parts that we should be able to consider um, uh, accelerating the opening of. Uh, what we need is a proper discussion that recognizes which sectors uh, start and, and, and how, how this, this, this goes through. I mean, there's been a debate in this country about, about rotisserie chickens, but, I mean, pause, pause and reflect on the fact that there are so many people in the ag agricultural stream, in the supply chain, long before those chickens get uh, onto a rotisserie, who are involved in, in the rearing of chickens, uh, be this on the... the feed side, the rearing side, the veterinary product side, or the logistics to get, to get chickens to market. Now, none of those things are available in the ways that people have sought. Surely, surely we must consider the health of people and, and, and employment and income is part of that general health. So why don't we examine supply chain by supply chain and ensure that we can deal with these issues in a way that preserves life but that doesn't impose unnecessary hardship on people. Now, you've been deployed as one of the African Union special envoys. This is uh, particularly to raise money uh, to fight COVID-19 on the continent. Are those efforts yielding any fruit? It's an ongoing battle. Um, there are five of us as envoys. Four of us uh, were finance ministers, and the other uh, was uh, uh, the CEO of a financial services company, frequently a European uh, financial services company. We work as a team. Uh, we have been working with uh, multilateral institutions, the World Bank and IMF, and this is our first port of call, uh, also with the G20, to try and ensure that we can uh, prevent uh, uh, debt services from happening for at least two years because debt service costs take $44 billion dollars off the African continent a year. And if we can preserve that $44 billion on the continent, we can do a lot more 
for health care and employment and livelihoods on the continent. We are also, uh, in fact, there was a discussion today um, with the private sector because some countries have borrowed from the private sector to ask how the same kinds of terms can, can be applied in those circumstances. That's, that's the first area of work we're doing. We also have to persuade donors to provide more money so that no country will be left behind immediately in the ability to deal with the urgency of COVID-9 operations. We have too few uh, uh, beds in ICUs across the, the, the continent, and then there must be a, a source of money, and it's not our uh, task to be involved in this, to procure uh, personal protective equipment, uh, test kits, uh, and, and later there will be the need for ventilators and so on and so on. Our job is to try and mobilize resources to ensure that that can be done. And then the third phase would be to ensure that we can assist uh, countries on this continent from rising up. One of the tragedies of COVID-19 is uh, it has wiped out 30 years of hard slog uh, by countries to restore macroeconomic balances and facilitate growth in their countries. And all of that has been wiped away. But with it, uh, not just the numbers in GDP and so on, but the livelihoods of people. So this is how we're setting about that task. All right. Uh, before I let you go, uh, Mr. Manuel, just in terms of some of the comments that uh, you've been making and uh, the analyses of, of the lockdown regulations, you're seen as somebody who's relatively close to the president. Uh, you could have easily picked up a phone, called him uh, to give him your view. Have you done that? Um, you know, uh, it's, it's not about the privacy of the president. I think that South Africans will start talking about what is happening in the lockdown, the more we talk about it, the more we will express what we agree with and what we disagree with. As we do that, all of us will own what it takes to prevent the spread of COVID-19 because the spread of COVID-19 uh, takes root very quickly in poor communities. We're seeing this in some communities. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the very high numbers in a place like Kailicha, for instance, where there has been testing and a number of deaths already. We must take that as our responsibility. And we can only do so if we feel that we can relate to the events of the lockdown. It is that discussion that we must have as a nation. It isn't pointing fingers at government. It isn't slamming government. It's about opening a conversation that we must have as South Africans because we trust each other and we live in this country together. And that's fair enough. But, but have you spoken to the president about it? Or do you intend on speaking to him about it directly? Look, we speak about a range of issues. Uh, my views would, in the public domain would not be a surprise to the President at all. <laughs> That's all I'm prepared to say. <laughs> all right. Trevor Manuel, thank you for your time on News at Prime tonight.